Hi, welcome back to 101 Things. In the last video, I walked through the build of a really simple software defined radio using a Pi Pico and a few simple components. If you didn't catch the first video, why not take a look? In this video, I'm going to take another look at the breadboard radio. I'm going to answer some questions and take a look at a couple of upgrades. I've had a lot of interest in the breadboard radio, and I would like to thank everyone for their kind comments and suggestions. I really appreciate you taking the time, and it really helps to improve the project. I'm going to start by answering some of the questions. One of the things that comes up most frequently is adding a transmit capability. Well, I'm sure it can be done, and it's definitely on the agenda. Earlier this year, I did a video about an experimental polar modulated transmitter using a Pi Pico. There's a link here if you want to check it out. It isn't a finished project, more of a proof of concept. There are a couple of kinks to iron out, but I was able to demonstrate transmitting in AM, FM and single sideband, and I was quite pleased with the results. Another option would be to use the spare half of the analog multiplexer to build a quadrature sampling exciter. This is a tried and tested method you've probably seen in other projects. Another question that's come up quite a lot is about the Pi Pico 2. Well, my Pi Pico 2 finally arrived last week and I was able to give it a try. The process was quite simple and I only had to change a couple of lines of code to get it working. I have to say I wasn't expecting too much of an improvement. The FPU and DSP coprocessor should give a massive boost, but all the DSP code in this design is written in fixed point. The clock frequency is a bit faster, but not by that much. I was pleasantly surprised by the performance boost. I've included a CPU monitor in the software that shows the CPU usage on Core 1. This is where all of the real-time DSP processing gets done, so it's the one that counts. With the Pi Pico, the CPU usage usually sits somewhere in the 80% region, depending on the mode. With the Pico 2, the usage dropped to around 40%. The Pico 2 comes with a choice of processor, either the ARM Cortex-M33 or the RISC-V Hazard 3. I tried both cores and got very similar results. I think we might see a lot more RISC-V processes in the future, so it's really quite promising to see that the level of performance is similar, for the fixed point software at least. I was also very curious to see whether the fix to the famous ADC bug would make any difference to the performance. I tried receiving stations and measuring the noise floor across a range of bands, but I couldn't see any measurable or noticeable difference. I think it would be quite difficult to predict analytically how much the bug would degrade the signal. But in this application, we're averaging hundreds of samples together, so I think that the odd bad ADC reading probably just gets lost in the noise. Another benefit of the increased clock frequency is that I can further improve the resolution of the local oscillator by increasing the range of clock frequencies. This buys me an extra couple of kilohertz, not a massive improvement, but it might make the performance a bit more predictable on the higher bands. I had one comment asking if the receiver could pick up weather facts. To be honest, I've never really tried this, so I thought it might be fun to give it a go. I used FL Digi on a PC with a sound card, and I didn't have any issues downloading weather maps. I think this is a really interesting bit of technology. I'm really impressed that it's possible to send weather maps using a narrow band HF channel, but I think it's even more impressive that people can actually read and interpret them. Quite a few people asked whether we could use a larger display with a waterfall. I think this is perfectly feasible and it's another upgrade that I will be looking at. I think I'll be adding this as an optional extra though. The OLED display does have a couple of advantages. It's very cheap and it's very low power. So I think this is ideal for an inexpensive entry level receiver and works really well in portable devices. I have to admit though, if you have the space for a waterfall, it does make it a lot easier to navigate the bands. I've also had a few questions about component availability, particularly the op-amps. Well, the good news is that they aren't anything particularly special, and it should be fairly easy to select a substitute. I'll quickly go over the specs and look at a couple of alternatives. I'm using the 3.3 volt output from the Pi Pico. That's mainly because it stays at a steady voltage regardless of the battery level, and I don't need to worry about overloading the ADC, which only works up to 3.3 volts. So the first thing to look for is a dual op amp that can run at 3.3 volts or less. We've reduced the bandwidth of the Taylor detector to about 12 kHz, and the gain's about 600. So a gain bandwidth product of about 10 MHz should be fine. The next thing to look at is the noise performance. If you look at Dan Taylor's paper, he does provide a formula to predict the minimum detectable signal based on the op amp spec. At HF frequencies, there's quite a lot of noise on the bands, so there's no point making the receiver too sensitive. When people talk about noise, they often quote this study, which shows the amount of man-made noise we can expect in different locations. 
I've plotted the expected band noise and the predicted receiver performance based on a specification of the op-amp. We can see that an amplifier with a noise density of 9 nanovolts will give a performance similar to that of a typical receiver, and the noise introduced by the amplifier will be lower than the band noise in most situations. So I think that we can say that 9 nanovolts is probably a good minimum to aim for. Of course there are some other things we might need to consider. If we have significant attenuation of the signal before the tailor detector, maybe because we've got filters or bag coax, then this will degrade the performance. On the other hand, if we had a high gain antenna, or an active antenna, or a preamplifier, then this would improve the performance of the system overall. So based on these minimum specs, I looked for a few alternatives and bought a few of the cheapest examples I could find. For comparison, I also tried a couple of high performance amplifiers as well. I tested all of these devices in the receiver and I'm happy to say that they all worked without issue. I didn't really see any difference in performance between any of the devices, so it's probably not worth going for a really expensive one. If you are having difficulty finding the right op amp, then this should give you a few more options. If you get really stuck, you could think about adapting the design to work with 5 volt devices too which should give you even more choices. I've been working on some improvements to the radio too. The first thing I've looked at is adding an external amplifier and speaker. Although a set of PC speakers seems to work really well, it's sometimes handy to have a built-in speaker, especially for portable use. There are quite a few options when it comes to low power amplifiers and speakers, and it's something you can easily tailor to your own needs and budget. If you'd like to see how I've approached the problem, why not take a look at the documentation page? As usual, there are links to the documentation, the circuits and the code in the description. So check these out if you want to try this for yourself, or if you want to just find out some more about the technical details. I've got a lot more upgrades and improvements planned for this receiver, and there are plenty of other projects in the pipeline too. If that's the type of thing that interests you, and you'd like to see more, why not subscribe? Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.